We here at We Will want to share with you today a small sample of the training that Glenn Morgan, who is a freedom and liberty political activist, came up to teach a group of our friends and neighbors. While he was here, he gave us a little update on what other freedom lovers in our state are working on. I think it's going to bring you a bit of hope to your day, especially if you love freedom and liberty. So it presents us with an unusual um, opportunity that I wouldn't have thought of and frankly hasn't been possible since 1996 in the state anyway. And it has to do with the initiative process. And I'm not a big fan overall of the initiative process only in the sense that it's a lot of time that you have to put into the process of collecting signatures. There's two types of initiatives. Uh, there's three under the state constitution. One's, one's called a referendum, which is essentially where you have to collect not so many signatures, but you gotta turn them in by July and it's to repeal a uh, something that the legislature just did that they they pass a law you don't like it you pass a referendum you put it on the ballot and the people get a vote on it um, the difficulty with the referendum and why i'm really not a fan of them is that the language that the law requires you to use is confusing here you go to collect signatures to put this thing on the ballot and then you have to vote against it and the language is very confusing the way that's written so frankly, probably about 30% of the people that vote on a referendum are actually thinking they're voting the opposite way of what they're actually voting. It's just a confusing part of the process. The other part that people are more familiar with is the initiative process. There's two types of initiatives. One's initiative to the people, and that means that you have to turn in, if you look at Secretary of State's website, 325,000 valid signatures by uh, July. And uh, which means you need to get about 15 to 20% more than that in order for it to be likely to survive signature challenges because people will accidentally sign twice or there'll be bad signatures. And so you need to turn about 400,000 signatures by July to the Secretary of State's office. And if that's accepted, then it goes on the ballot in November. So that's an issue of the people. The other one that is more interesting and what we're gonna talk about is, is just a little bit, is the initiative to the legislature. You have to collect the same number of signatures, 400,000, but you don't have to turn in until December. So people, you have a lot longer period of time to collect signatures uh, all the way from now until December. So much more, uh, the length of time is a little bit friendlier. And that process means that that initiative lands on the legislature's desks in January, and they get to decide whether they're gonna support it, ignore it, or reject it. Or um, there's another option they would have, which is modify or pr present an alternative on the ballot. Typically what happens is it gets to them and then it gets put on the ballot in November. And uh, then the voters decide on it, but it would be next November, November of 2023. However, uh, because it looks like it's, there's a pretty realistic possibility that Republicans may control both houses uh, after this election cycle, at least uh, for a couple years, then if they actually get a freedom and liberty oriented initiative that lands on their desk, they may actually put it into law. They may actually sign it into law. So that option hasn't existed for us since 1996. And so nobody's really thought about approaching this like I actually want the legislature to put it in, uh, sign it into law, but here's what makes it unique. Inslee can't veto it. It's veto proof. It means that initiative to the legislature, if you had a friendly legislature and they put it into law, is veto proof and it changes the calculation for activists on why we would bother to spend the energy and time to give a couple of initiatives to the legislature for them to vote into law because Inslee can't do a darn thing about it because how many of you have heard and I'm sure you have where people say what's the point of electing a, a Republican legislature if Inslee can just veto whatever they do right how many of you have heard this good because I've heard it a lot I've heard it for a long time. And it changes the calculus as well then for how important it is to actually elect people. Even the crappiest, worst Republican running for office somewhere is still better than the best Democrat you'll ever find because they're, they're more likely to vote in lockstep to approve some initiative ideas that we would care about from a freedom and liberty oriented side of things. So in the last month, activists around the state have gotten together with attorneys and some funding as well to look at running some initiatives to the legislature as an idea. And uh, I'll give you a, a sampling of what these would be and explain about it a little bit more and why I think it's gonna matter. One of them is an initiative to the legislature that uh, restricts the governor's emergency powers. And it says that uh, in the future, the governor can only have emergency powers, can only declare an emergency for 30 days, and then he has to mandatorily require an in-person 
reconvene the legislature, and the legislature has to vote both houses on every county individually, all 39 counties individually, on whether they deserve to be in the eternal emergency lockdown. And um, that will end in any kind of option in the future for any other governor to ever do the perpetual, endless, never-ending emergency that Inslee has now. The reason why is that even Democrats who seem to love the eternal lockdowns, even they want to actually campaign for office, and they're not going to want to keep going into the legislative session, which means it shuts off their ability to fundraise and to uh, campaign to go vote on Inslee's stupid emergency powers every 30 days, right? They've, he's been able to maintain it this, this long because it's been relatively painless for him to do it. So, um, so that's one. So the second one is to allow uh, police to pursue criminals again. Um, yep, that's a radical idea. And uh, he, even the Democrats know that was a stupid element of their, uh, their uh, pro-crime agenda. And, uh, but they were too incompetent to actually get that part fixed in the legislature this last time. It's a good one to run and uh, show them that this is what real laws actually look like. A third one would be for curriculum in schools to mandate that all curriculum in schools has to be published on the website downloadable, you don't need a records request, and that everybody can see what curriculum is being taught in all the schools at any given time, require it. Fourth one would be to say that all um, laws that apply to uh, gun ownership in, in Washington state can only be applied to uh, convicted felons, as helpfully re defined by Democrats recently. So uh, it means that it doesn't apply to law-abiding citizens, which essentially rolls back 1639, 594, high cap mag ban, anything that's been done in the last 15 years or so. And uh, I, I do enjoy and look forward to Democrats arguing that, that they should be allowed to have it. So that'll be fine. But anyway, that's a, that's a good one. Another one cuts the gas tax in half. Uh, it cuts 24 cents a gallon off the gas tax. Uh, that's gonna be relatively popular. Um, for those who don't think, who think somehow our transportation budget uh, is unduly harmed by cutting the gas tax in half, uh, we also put together a budget to help educate our, our friendly legislators that you can actually double how much money they spend on roads and bridges today and uh, still have plenty of billions of dollars to squander and put down rat holes all over the place uh, with the gas tax cut with, uh, in half. So even with it cut in half, there's ample money to waste. Another one is based on the sales tax proposal that a Democrat legislator actually proposed this last cycle, Mona Doss out of the 47th, um, and they couldn't get passed, because how many of you have heard that the sales tax is, is very regressive, right? Oh yeah, the Democrats say it all the time. Now they don't really believe that because they proposed it and they didn't want to pass it because that was going to require them. For every 1% that you cut on the sales tax, it takes $4.7 billion out of the budget, right? And the last thing you really want to do is take money from your grifting friends in state agencies or the, you know, the kickback schemes that exist all around the state. So they didn't really pass it. They proposed it and they say that, but they don't believe it. So uh, this one is a 2% cut in sales tax, right? Um, take what their idea was, double it, and let's run that. And uh, after all, they did squander $17 billion in extra money that they had as a surplus in the budget this last time. So uh, uh, why not do it this way? Another one's gonna be a uh, repeal of the capital gains tax. So anyway, you get the picture. These are, none of these are radical ideas. Um, all of these are ideas that uh, anybody who has an R next to their name, and frankly, good chunk of the people who have D's next to their name should be willing to accept as legitimate reforms and necessary laws. And the beauty is Inslee can't, can't repeal it. It also gives us the ability to have instant victory, let's just say that, or at least success of some kind, if you do get a Republican legislature in both houses. They have the ability to actually do something that Inslee can't veto. It's actually advancing freedom and liberty. And it also sends a very clear message to Inslee that whatever he decides to veto this next time, that if we can do it this time, we can do it again. So it's a, it's a really different picture than what has existed in this state ever. So nobody alive today has ever seen this. It's never been done. It's very new. It's very unusual. Um, the other problem that we've had in the past when we wanted to do projects like this is we didn't have funding. But this time uh, we had somebody who was willing to step forward and actually support this campaign. Now, they're not using paid signature gatherers. This is a volunteer effort. So it's a lot of work, there's a lot of people. We've got a bunch of churches that have already signed up that are interested in, in running this campaign out of the churches. Um, we've got the majority of the gun shops in Washington State, large group of volunteers, about 3,000 of them right now who are willing to go out and push this. We've got a lot of events that'll be scheduled. This is gonna be a full-scale circus time for uh, campaigning in a different way to collect signatures for these initiatives. And there, it's, it's an effort for a purpose. 
But we had somebody with deeper pockets, a guy named Brian Haywood, who's been willing to put in the money to make this happen. So you'll hear his name because um, when you set up a political action committee and you're more than 80% of the funding, you're obligated to identify yourself in the title of the PAC. So the Let's Go Washington PAC, sponsored by Brian Haywood. It's gonna be about as obvious as you can get who's funding it and why. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting opportunity and you will be hearing about it in a couple weeks and uh, it's gonna be a fairly big launch. I anticipate the launch kind of in the end of May um, and uh, it's gonna be pretty widespread. It's a lot of work, it's not simple, it's not easy, I don't pretend it, that it is, but uh, there's a lot of interest and incentive and how many of you are familiar with uh, intersectionality? On the left, intersectionality. So the idea on the left, intersectionality, is that if all you care about is, uh, I don't know, uh, global warming, and all you care about is social justice, and all you care, you know, these different pockets of people who have a, their little, you know, you want to ban fur, whatever it is, but you all come together on each other's issues, and that's your intersectionality, right? You're going to focus on all these issues together. And I, I know I'm simplifying it, so if you've studied this at all, um, this is kind of like intersectionality for freedom and liberty. Uh, pro Second Amendment people will be carrying all 10, you know, people who want curriculum transparency are going to be carrying all 10, people who want lower taxes are carrying all 10, and it, you know, or however, I, I think they're going to have about 10 of these. So it's, it's an unusual campaign. It's an exciting campaign. It's very, it's very different than anything I've seen before. We were able to get, at least preliminarily, all these groups around the state that don't like each other even sometimes. Um, the, even the different factions that hate each other are all willing to support the same effort because there's a clear rec recognition that um, this would be a big change at, in Washington state. And it's a step in the right direction. It's not the universal utopian solution to all problems, but it is a way to step forward and make an impact and make a difference. So um, I think that that's an exciting project and I just want to make sure you know about it because it's coming, it's gonna be, you will not be able to miss it, but it's gonna come and you'll probably see this hit uh, your community here in Linden and Bellingham as well. And uh, it, it's gonna be all around Washington State by the end of this next month and I anticipate it making quite an impact. Uh, for the first three or four months, I anticipate everybody, political insiders will say that we're all idiots and that, that it's impossible and we can't do it. Uh, and then probably they'll start to realize the pro progress that I would anticipate that we make um, by, the end of, uh, by the end of the summer and then we'll just get attacked because everybody's a racist. So um, anyway, so that, that'll be, it'll be some, you know, you'll, you'll see something like that going on. Uh, that's a big deal. It is. Um, it's, it's unique. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like this happen before. When activists have tried to do something on a much more narrow basis, we've usually run into problems where either we didn't have enough money to even get it launched, or uh, it was too late in the process, or there, there were other problems that have come up, and it's this unusual um, combination of circumstances that seems to give us this opportunity right now. He showed us how to do the type of research he does so that we can keep our local government officials accountable. Sorry if you missed it, but Glenn has agreed to come back later this year to teach us some additional tools, so be on the lookout for that information.